Here's Hyde Park Corner, 1895, when Grandmama and Leisure were alive. When Britain ruled the wave and held the purse, here was the center of the universe. Here brooms were drawn by spankers, silver bitted. Maids were wasp wasted and their men wasp witted. Youth is an art and beauty a profession. The season spins and parliaments in session. Oh, laces, graces, 18 button gloves. Oh, chaperones, silk hats and scandal loves. The naughty 90s close upon the screen. Victoria reigns, but fashion is the queen. Got another buttonhole for me, Phipps? Yes, my lord. It's a rather distinguished thing, Phipps. I'm the only person of the smallest importance in London at present who wears a buttonhole. Yes, my lord, I have observed that. You see, Phipps, fashion is what one wears oneself. What is unfashionable is what other people wear. Yes, my lord. Just as vulgarity is simply the conduct of other people. Yes, my lord. Falsehood is the truth of other people. Yes, my lord. Though other people are quite dreadful, Phipps. The only possible society is oneself. Yes, my lord. To love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance, Phipps. Yes, my lord. I'm not quite sure I like this buttonhole, Phipps. It makes me look a little old. Almost in the prime of life, eh, Phipps? I have not observed any alteration in your lordship's appearance. You haven't, Phipps? No, my lord. No, I'm not so sure. Now, the future, the more trivial buttonhole, Phipps, on Thursday evening. I will speak to the florist, my lord. She has had a loss in her family lately, which perhaps accounts for the lack of triviality your lordship complains of in the buttonhole. It's the thing about the lower classes in England, Phipps. They're always losing their relations. Mm, yes, my lord. They are extremely fortunate in that respect. Thank you. You can go now, Mary. Gertrude, I wish you would speak to Tommy Trafford. What has poor Mr. Trafford done this time? Robert says he's the best secretary he's ever had. Tommy has proposed to me again. Tommy really does nothing but propose to me. He proposed to me last night in the music room when I was quite unprotected as there was an elaborate trio going on. 
Benny proposed in broad daylight this morning in front of that dreadful statue of Achilles. And then Tommy is so annoying in the way in which he proposes. If he proposed at the top of his voice, I should not mind so much. It might produce some effect on the public. But he always does it in a horrid, confidential way. I wish, Gertrude, that you would speak to him and tell him that once a week is quite often enough to propose to anyone, and that it should always be done in a manner that attracts some attention. Robert thinks very highly of Mr. Trafford. He believes he has a brilliant future before him. Oh, I could never marry a man with a future before him. Not for anything under the sun. Mabel. I know, dear. You married a man with a future, didn't you? But then my brother is a genius. And you have a noble, self-sacrificing character. You can stand genius. I have no character at all. And Robert is the only genius that I've ever been able to bear. As a rule, I find them quite impossible. Geniuses talk so much, don't they? Such a bad habit. And they're always thinking about themselves when I want them to be thinking about me. Robert, doesn't she look beautiful? Yes, you do look beautiful. They've started to arrive. I think we'd better go downstairs. of you to invite me. Robert, did that good-for-nothing young son of mine been here? I don't think Lord Goring's arrived yet. Good evening, Lord Captain. Oh. Why do you call Lord Goring a good-for-nothing? Because he leads such an idle life. How can you say such a thing? Why, he rides in the row at 10 o'clock in the morning. He goes to the opera three times a week. He changes his clothes at least five times a day, and he dines out every night of the season. You don't call that leading an idle life, do you? You're a very charming young lady. How sweet of you to say so, Lord Cavisham. Do come to us more often. We're always at home on when. No, no, no. Never go out now. Sick of London society. Wouldn't mind being introduced to my own tailor. He always votes the right side. But object strongly to being sent down to dinner with my wife's milliner. I never could stand Lady Cavisham's bonnets. But I love London society. I think it immensely improved. It is now entirely composed of beautiful idiots and brilliant lunatics. Just what society should be. Oh, and which is Goring? A beautiful idiot or the other thing? I've been obliged for the present to put Lord Goring into a class quite by himself. But he is developing charmingly. Oh, into what? I hope to let you know very soon, Lord Capshaw. <laughs> Let me bring my friend, Mrs. Keebley. Two such charming women should know each other. 
I think Mrs. Cheveley and I have met before. I did not know she had married for a second time. Oh, nowadays people marry as often as they can, don't they? It's most fashionable. But have we really met before? I can't remember where. I've been out of England for so long. We were at school together, Mrs. Cheveley. Indeed. <laughs> I've forgotten all about my school days. I have a vague impression that they were detestable. I'm not surprised. You know, I'm quite looking forward to meeting your clever husband, Lady Chilton. Ah, chère madame, quelle surprise. Uh, I have not seen you since um, Madrid. Not since Madrid, because. Sir Archibald and Lady Monaghan. Lord and Lady Forfeiture. You are younger and more beautiful than ever. How do you manage it? By making it a rule only to talk to perfectly charming people like yourself. Ah, <laughs> uh, you flatter me. You uh, butter me, as they say in England. Oh, do they say that here? How dreadful of them. My dear, Sir Robert Chilton is dying to know you. Everyone's dying to know the brilliant Mrs. Cheever. Our attaches in turn are right to us of nothing uh, else. Thank you, Sir Robert. An acquaintance that begins with a compliment is sure to develop into a real friendship. It starts in the right manner. And I find I know Lady Chilton already. Oh, really? Yes. She just reminded me that we were at school together. I remember it perfectly now. She always got the Good Conduct Prize. I have a distinct recollection of Lady Chilton always getting the Good Conduct Prize. And what prizes did you get, Mrs. Chilton? <laughs> My prizes came a little later on in life. I don't think any of them were for Good Conduct. I'm sure they were for something charming. I don't know that women are always rewarded for being charming. I think they're usually punished for it. Tell me, what makes you leave brilliant Vienna for our gloomy London? Is it politics or is it pleasure? Politics are my only pleasure. A political life is a noble career. Sometimes. And sometimes it's a clever game. Sometimes it's a great nuisance. And which do you find it? I? <laughs> a combination of all three. Mr. and Mrs. Rupert Arrowsmith. Lord Goring. You're very late. You missed me? Awfully. I'm sorry I didn't stay away longer. I like being missed. How very selfish of you. Oh, but I am very selfish. You're always telling me of your bad qualities, Lord Goring. But I've only told you half of them as yet, Miss Mabel. Are the others very bad? Quite dreadful. When I think of them at night, I go to sleep at once. Well, I delight in your bad qualities. I wouldn't have you part with one of them. How very nice. And you always are very nice. By the way, Miss Mabel, I want to ask you a question. Who brought Mrs. Cheveley that woman in emerald green? Oh, I think Lady Markby brought her. What sort of woman is she? Oh, a genius by day and a beauty at night. I dislike her already. That shows your admirable good taste. May I have the pleasure of escorting you to the music room, mademoiselle? Delighted. Quite delighted. Well, sir, and what are you doing here? Wasting your life as usual? You ought to be in bed. You keep too late hours. Heard of you the other night. That Lady Rufford's dancing till four o'clock in the morning. No, Father, only quarter to four. Can't make out how you stand London society. Things have gone to the dogs. A lot of silly nobodies talking about nothing. But I love talking about nothing, Father. It's the only thing I know anything about. But you seem to live entirely for pleasure. What else is there to live for, Father? Nothing ages like happiness. You're heartless, sir. Very heartless. Oh, I hope not, Father. How's your husband? What makes you honor London so suddenly? Our season's nearly over. I wanted to meet you. It's quite true. You know what a woman's curiosity is. It's almost as great as a man. I wanted immensely to meet you and to ask you to do something for me. Well, I hope it's not a little thing. I always find that little things are so difficult to do. No, I uh, don't think it's quite a little thing. I'm so glad. Do tell me, what is it? Later on. And now, may I walk through your beautiful house? I hear your pictures are charming. Poor Baron Arnheim. You remember the Baron. You used to tell me you had some wonderful paintings. Did you know the Baron well? Intimately, did you? That one time, yes. Wonderful man, wasn't he? He was most remarkable in many ways. I often think it's such a pity that he never wrote his memoirs. They would have been most interesting. Now, oh, my dear Arthur. Mrs. Cheveley, allow me to introduce Lord Goring, the idlest man in London. I've met Lord Goring before. I didn't think you'd remember me, Mrs. Cheveley. My memory's under admirable control. 
And are you still a bachelor? I believe so. How oh, very romantic. Oh, I'm not at all romantic. I'm not old enough. I leave romance to my seniors. Lord Goring is the result of Boodle's Club, Mrs. Judith. He reflects every credit on the institution. A man talked to me about his wife the whole time. How very trivial of him. What martyrs we are, dear Margaret. And how well it becomes us, Olivia. I'm afraid Lord Goring is a Mackenzie enemy, as usual. I saw him talking to that Mrs. Cheveley when he came in. A very handsome woman, Mrs. Cheveley. He then praised other women in our presence. You might wait for us to do that. I did wait. Well, we are not going to praise her. I hear that she went to the opera on Monday night and said that as far as she could see, London society was entirely made up of dowdies and dandies. Oh, she's quite right there. The men are all dowdies and the women are all dandies, aren't they? Oh, do you really think that is what Mrs. Cheveley meant? Why are you talking about Mrs. Cheveley? Everybody is talking about Mrs. Cheveley. Lord Goring, I'm very hungry. Would you give me some supper? With pleasure. Oh, very horrid tonight. You've hardly spoken to me at all. How could I? You went off with a child diplomat. You should have followed us. The suit would have been at least polite. I don't think I like you at all this evening. I like you tremendously. Well, I wish you'd be a little more marked about it. feeling of absolute failure. I think I should like some supper very much. I know I should like some supper. I'm positively dying for supper, Margaret. Men are so horribly selfish. They never think of these things. Men are grossly material. Grossly material. Cortez, may I have the honor of taking you down to supper? I never take supper, thank you, Vicomte. But I will come down with you with pleasure. Some supper, Mrs. Marchmont. Thank you, Mr. Monford. I never touch supper. But I will sit beside you and watch you. I don't know that I like being watched when I'm eating. Then I will watch someone else. I don't think I should like that either. Pray, Mr. Monford, do not make these painful scenes of jealousy in public. <laughs> I want to talk to you about a great political and financial scheme. About the Argentine Canal scheme, in fact. Oh, what a tedious and practical subject to talk about. Oh, I like tedious, practical subjects. But I don't like a tedious, practical people. Besides, you are interested, I know, in international canal schemes. You were Lord Bradley's secretary, weren't you, when the government bought the Suez Canal shares? Ah, oh, but the Suez Canal was a great and splendid undertaking. This Argentine scheme is nothing but a commonplace stock exchange swindle. Speculation, Sir Robert. A brilliant, daring speculation. Believe me, Mrs. Cheveley, it's a swindle. Let us call things by their proper names. It makes matters simpler. We have all the information about it at the Foreign Office. I hope you've not invested in it. I've invested very largely. Who could have advised you to do such a foolish thing? Your old friend of mine, Baron Arnheim. It was his last romance. His last but one to do him justice. Well, Mrs. Chibley, I fear I have no advice to offer you, except to interest yourself in something a little less dangerous. The success of the canal, of course, depends on the attitude of England, and I am to lay my report before the House tomorrow night. That you must not do, Sir Robert. In your own interest, to say nothing of mine, you must not do that. My own interests? My dear Mrs. Chibley, what do you mean? Sir Robert, I will be quite frank with you. I want you to withdraw the report that you'd intended to lay before the House on the ground that you have reasons to believe that the commissioners have been prejudiced or misinformed or something. Then I want you to say a few words to the effect that the government is going to reconsider the question and that you have reasons to believe that the canal, if completed, will be of great international value. Will you do that for me? Mrs. Cheveley, you cannot be serious in making me such a proposition. Oh, but I'm quite serious. Oh, pray allow me to believe that you are not. Oh, but I am. And if you do what I ask you to, I will pay you very handsomely. Pay me? Yes. I'm afraid I don't understand what you mean. Oh, how disappointing. And I've come all the way from Vienna in order that you should thoroughly understand me. 
I fear that I do not. My dear Sir Robert, you're a man of the world, and you have your price, I suppose. Everybody has nowadays. The only drawback is that most people are so dreadfully expensive. I know I am. I hope that you will be more reasonable in your terms. If you'll allow me, I'll call your carriage for you now. You've lived abroad so long, Mrs. Cheveley, you seem unable to realize you're talking to a gentleman. Wait. I realize that I'm talking to a man who laid the foundation of his fortune by selling to the stock exchange speculator a cabinet secret. What do you mean? I mean that I know the real origin of your wealth and your career. And I've got your letter, too. What letter? The letter you wrote to Baron Arnheim when you were Lord Radley's secretary, telling the Baron to buy Suez Canal shares. A letter written three days before the government announced its own purchase. It's not true. You thought that letter had been destroyed. How foolish of you. I have it in my possession. The affair to which you allude was no more than a speculation. The House of Commons had not yet passed the bill. It might have been rejected. It was a swindle, Sir Robert. Let us call things by their proper names. It makes matters simpler. And now I'm going to sell you that letter. And the price I ask is your public support of the Argentine scheme. I cannot do what you ask me. You mean you cannot help doing it? It's not for you to make terms, it's for you to accept them. Suppose you refuse. What then? My dear Sir Robert, what then? You're ruined, that is all. Suppose that I leave this house and drive to some newspaper office and give them this scandal and the proofs of it. Think of their loathsome joy, of the delight they would have in dragging you down, of the mud and mire they'd plunge you in. Stop. You want me to withdraw the report and make a short speech? saying, I think there are possibilities in the scheme. Those are my terms. I'll give you any sum of money you want. Even you are not rich enough, Sir Robert, to buy back your past. No man is. You must give me time to consider your proposal. No, you must settle now. Give me a week. Three days. Impossible. I must telegraph to Vienna tonight. I consent. Oh, thank you. I knew we should come to an amicable agreement. And uh, now you may call my carriage for me. I see that the people are coming up from supper. Englishmen always get so romantic after a meal, and it bores me dreadfully. Charming house you have, Lady Chilton. I've spent a delightful evening. It's been so interesting getting to know your husband. Why did you wish to meet my husband, Mrs. Cheveley? I will tell you. I wanted to interest him in this Argentine Canal scheme, of which I dare say you've heard. I found him most susceptible. Susceptible to reason, I mean. A rare thing in a man. I converted him in ten minutes. He's going to make a speech in the house tomorrow night in favor of the idea. We must go to the ladies' gallery to hear him. It will be a great occasion. There must be some mistake. That scheme could never have my husband's support. Oh, I assure you, it's all settled. I don't regret my tedious journey from Vienna now. It's been a great success. But of course, for the next 24 hours, the whole thing must be a dead secret. A secret? Between whom? Between your husband and myself. Your carriage is here, Mrs. Jim. Thanks. Will you see me down, Sir Robert? Now that we both have the same interests at heart, we should be great friends, I hope. Good night, lady children. Someone has dropped a diamond brooch. Why 
beautiful, isn't it? I wonder to whom it belongs. I wonder who dropped it. Is it beautiful, Birch? It's a very handsome bracelet. It isn't a bracelet, it's a brooch. It can be used as a bracelet. What are you doing? Miss Mabel, I'm going to make a rather strange request to you. Oh, pray do. I've been waiting for it all evening. Don't mention to anybody I've taken charge of this brooch. If anybody write and claim it, let me know at once. That is a very strange request. Well, you see, I gave it to somebody once. You did? Yes. Then I shall certainly bid you good night. I saw whom Lady Markby brought here tonight. Yes, it was an unpleasant surprise. What did she come here for? Apparently hoping to lure Robert to uphold some fraudulent scheme she's interested in. She's mistaken her man, hasn't she? She's incapable of understanding an upright character like my husband. <laughs> yes. I fancy she came to grief if she tried to get Robert in her toils. It's extraordinary what astounding mistakes clever women make. I don't call women of that kind clever. I call them stupid. It's often the same thing. Good night, Lady Chilton. Oh, my dear Arthur, not going already? Do stay a little. No, I'm afraid I can't, thanks. I promised looking at the heart locks. I believe they've got a move Hungarian band that plays move Hungarian music. I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Put out the lights, Mason. Very well, Sir Robert. going to give your support to the speculation. Who told you I intended to do so? Mrs. Cheveley, as she calls herself now, she seemed to taunt me with it. Robert, you don't know this woman. I do. We were at school together. She was untruthful and dishonest. She was sent away for being a thief. Why do you let her influence you? What you say may be true, but it's best forgotten. It happened many years ago. Mrs. Cheveley may have changed since then. No one should be judged entirely by their past. One's past is what one is. It is the only way by which people should be judged. That's a hard saying. It is a true saying, Robert. And what did she mean by boasting that she had got you to give your name, your support, to a thing which I have heard you describe as the most dishonest and fraudulent scheme there has ever been in political life? I was mistaken in the view I took, that's all. We all may make mistakes. I have reason now to believe that the Commission was prejudiced, or at any rate misinformed. Besides, public and private life are two different things. They should both represent man at his highest. I see no difference between them. In the present case, on a matter of practical politics, I've changed my mind, that's all. Oh. Yes. It's horrible that I should have to ask you such a question. Are you telling me the whole truth? Why do you ask me such a question? Why do you not answer it? Truth is a very complex thing, Gertrude. And politics is a very complex business. One may be under certain obligations to people one must pay. Sooner or later, in political life, one must compromise. Everyone does. Compromise? Why do you talk so differently tonight from the way I've always heard you talk? Why are you so changed? I'm not changed. But circumstances alter things. Supposing... Supposing I were to tell you it was necessary. Vitally necessary. It can never be necessary to do what is dishonorable. Why should it be? You have no right to use that word. I've told you it's a matter of rational compromise, that's all. That may be true for other men, but not for you. You are different. To the world, as to myself, you have been an ideal always. Be that ideal still. Don't kill my love for you. Don't do that. Gertrude. Is there in your life any secret disgrace? Tell me. Tell me at once that... that our lives may drift apart. Drift apart? 
But they may be entirely separate. It would be better for us both. There is nothing in my past life you might not know. I was sure of it. You will write, won't you, to Mrs. Cheesley and tell her you cannot support this scheme of hers. I might see her personally, that'd be better. No, you must never see her again. She is not a woman you should ever speak to. Right now, right this moment. And let her understand that your decision is irrevocable. She must know that she has been mistaken in you. Write that you cannot support this business scheme. Yes, write the word dishonest. She knows what that word means. That will do now, the envelope. Mary. Keep this letter to Mason and see it's delivered at once. There is no answer. Robert, love gives one an instinct for things. I feel that tonight I've saved you from something that might have been a danger to you. I don't think you realize that in the political life of our time, you have brought higher ideas. And for that, I love you. Love me always. My dear Robert, it's a very awkward business. Very awkward indeed. You should have told your wife the whole thing. No man should have a secret from his own wife. She invariably finds it out. Women have a wonderful instinct about things. They can discover everything. Except the obvious. It would have meant a lifelong separation between us. I should have lost the love of the only woman in the world I worship. She'd have turned from me in horror. In horror and in contempt. Is Lady Chilton as perfect as all that? Yes, my wife's as perfect as all that. What a pity. If what you tell me is true, I'd like to have a serious talk about life with Lady Chilton. It would be quite useless. Well, I'm bound to say I think you should have told her a year ago. When? When we were engaged? Do you think she'd have married me if she'd known I'd done a thing which I suppose most men would call shameful and dishonorable? Yes, most men would call it ugly names. There's no doubt about that. Whom did I wrong by what I did? No one. Except yourself, Robert. Do you think it fair that a man's whole career should be ruined for a fault done in his boyhood almost? I was 22 at the time. I had the double misfortune of being well-born and poor. Two unforgivable things nowadays. Is it fair that the folly of one's youth should wreck a life like mine? Is it fair, Arthur? Life is never fair, Robert. Perhaps it's a good thing for most of us that it's not. Every man of ambition has to fight his century with its own weapon. What this century worships is wealth. The god of this century is wealth. To succeed, one must have wealth. At all cost, one must have wealth. You underrate yourself, Robert. Believe me, without wealth, you could have succeeded just as well. When I was old, perhaps. When I was tired, worn out, disappointed. I wanted my success when I was young. I couldn't wait. Robert, how could you have sold yourself for money? I did not sell myself for money. I bought success at a great price, that's all. Yes, you certainly paid a great price for it. What first made you think of doing such a thing? Baron Arnheim. That scoundrel? No. He was a man of the most subtle and refined intellect. A man of charm and culture and distinction. I prefer a gentlemanly fool any day. There's more to be said for stupidity than people imagine. Personally, I have a great admiration for stupidity. A sort of fellow feeling, I suppose. But how did he do it? Tell me the whole thing. One evening after dinner at Lord Radley's, the Baron began talking about success in modern life as something one could reduce to an absolutely definite science. And with that wonderfully fascinating, quiet voice of his, he expounded to us the most terrible of all philosophies, the philosophy of power. He preached to us the most marvelous of all Gospels, the Gospel of Gold. I think he saw the effect he produced on me, for some days later he wrote and asked me to go and see him. I remember so well how with a strange smile on his pale, curved lips, he led me through his wonderful picture gallery. Showed me his tapestries, his enamels, his duels, his carved ivories. And made me wonder at the loveliness of the luxury in which he lived. Then he told me that luxury was nothing but a background. A painted scene in a play. And that power. Power over other men. Power over the world was the one thing that really mattered. 
the one supreme pleasure worth having, the one joy one never tired of. And that in this century, only the rich possess it. A thoroughly shallow creed. I didn't think so then, I don't think so now. Wealth has given me enormous power. At the very outset of my life, it gave me freedom. And freedom is everything. You've never been poor. You've never known what ambition is. You can't realize what a wonderful chance the Baron gave me. Such a chance as few men get. Fortunately for them, if one is to judge by results. But tell me definitely, how did the Baron finally persuade you to, well, do what you did? Just as I was leaving, he said to me that if ever I could give him any private information of real value, he would make me a very rich man. Six weeks later, certain private documents passed through my hands. State documents? Yes. I had no idea that you, of all men in the world, could have been as weak, Robert, as to yield to such a temptation. Weak. I'm sick of hearing that phrase. Sick of using it about others. Weak. Do you really think, Arthur, that it's weakness that yields to temptation? I tell you, there are terrible temptations. It takes strength. Strength and courage to yield to. To stake one's whole life on a single moment. To risk everything on one throw. There's no weakness in that. It takes a horrible, a terrible courage. I had that courage. The same afternoon, I sat down and wrote there and on high the letter this woman now holds. He made three quarters of a million out of the transaction. And you? I received from the Baron 110,000 pounds. You were worth more, Robert. No, that money gave me exactly what I wanted. Power over others. Tell me, Arthur, do you despise me for what I just told you? I'm very sorry for you, Robert. Very sorry indeed. And I'll help you in whatever way I can. Of course, you know that. Thank you, Arthur. What's to be done? What can be done? Well, the English can't stand a man who's always saying he's in the right, but they're very fond of a man who admits he's been in the wrong. It's one of the best things in them. However, in your case, Robert, a confession wouldn't do. The money, if you'll allow me to say so, is awkward. Besides, if we did make a clean breast of the whole affair, you wouldn't be able to talk morality again. In England, a man who can't talk morality twice a week to a large, popular, immoral audience is quite finished as a serious politician. No, a confession would be of no use. It would ruin you. The only thing for me to do now is to fight the thing out. I was waiting for you to say that. It's the only thing to do now. You must begin by telling your wife the whole story. No, that I will not do. But Robert, believe me, you're wrong. I couldn't do it. It would kill her love for me. And what about this woman, this Mrs. Cheveley? You knew her before, apparently. Uh, yes. Did you know her well? So little that I got engaged to be married to her once. The affair lasted three days, nearly. Why was it broken off? Oh, I forget. At least it makes no matter. By the way, have you tried it with money yet? She used to be confoundedly fond of money. I offered Andy some she wanted to use you. Ah, then the marvelous gospel of gold breaks down sometimes. The rich can't do everything after all. Perhaps you're right, Arthur. I feel that public disgrace is in store for me. I feel certain of it. I never knew what terror was before. I know it now. Well, I'll send a cipher telegram to the embassy at Vienna at once. There may be something known against her. Some secret scandal she's afraid of. Oh, I should fancy Mrs. Chief is to be one of those very modern women of our time who find a new scandal as becoming as a new bonnet. And they have them both in the park every afternoon at 5.30. Oh, I think she adores scandals. And the sorrow of her life at present is she can't manage to get enough of them. Why do you say that? Well, she wore far too much rouge last night and not quite enough clothes. That's always a sign of despair in a woman. Yes, she looks like a woman of the past, doesn't she? Most pretty women do. But there's a fashion in pasts, just as there's a fashion in frocks. Perhaps Mrs. Cheveley's past is merely a little too revealing. I'll fight her as long as my wife knows nothing. If she were to fight out, there'd be little left to fight for. You fight her, in any case. <laughs> I'm glad we've met. There's something I want to talk to you about. You want to talk to me about Mrs. Cheeley? You have guessed it. After you had left last night, I found out that what she had said was quite true. Of course, I made Robert write her a letter at once, withdrawing his promise. 
Louis gave me to understand. To have kept it would have been a stain on a career that has been stainless always. Robert must be above reproach. He cannot do what other men do. Surely you agree with me. You're his greatest friend. He has no secrets from me, and I'm sure he has none from you. No, he certainly has no secrets from me. At least, I don't think so. Then am I not right in my estimate? I know that I'm right. But speak to me quite frankly. Quite frankly? Surely you have nothing to conceal. Nothing. But, my dear Lady Chilton, I think, if you'll allow me to say so, that in practical life... Of which you know so little? Of which I know nothing by experience, though I know something by observation. I think that in practical life there is something about success that is a little unscrupulous. Something about ambition that is unscrupulous always. Once a man has set his heart and soul and get to a certain point, if he has to climb a crag, he will climb a crag. If he has to walk in the mire... Well? To walk in the mire, of course, I'm only talking generally about life. I hope so. Why are you looking at me so strangely? Lady Chilton, I have sometimes thought that perhaps you're a little hard in some of your views on life. I think that sometimes you don't make sufficient allowances. In every nature, there are elements of weakness or worse than weakness. Supposing, for instance, any public figure, my father or Robert, say, had years ago written a foolish letter to somebody. What do you mean by a foolish letter? A letter gravely compromising one's position. Of course, I'm only putting an imaginary case. Robert is as incapable of doing a foolish thing as he is of doing a wrong one. <laughs> Lady Chilton, if ever you're in trouble, trust me absolutely. I'll help you in whatever way I can. If ever you want me, come to me for my assistance and you shall have it. Come at once to me. You're talking quite seriously. I don't think I've ever heard you talk seriously before. You must forgive me. It won't occur again if I can help it. Lord Goring. Good afternoon, Miss Mabel. Good afternoon. Will you ride tomorrow? Yes, at ten. Sharp? Quite sharp. Don't forget. Of course I shall. What can you tell me about this, Mr. Combeltzer? I know it, of course. We sold it to you about, let me see, eight years ago. It was a special order because of the hidden spring in the mechanism. It was to be a gift for your cousin Lady Berkshire, wasn't it? Yes. You quite sure it's the same piece? There can't be the slightest doubt. Here's our mark. Thank you. Yellow is a gay colour, is it not? I used to wear yellow a great deal in my early days. And you do so still if Sir John were not so painfully personal in his observations. And a man on the question of dress is always ridiculous, is he not? Oh, no, I think men are the only authorities on dress. There, there. One wouldn't say so from the sort of hats they wear, would one? Gertrude, who do you think has come to see you? That dreadful Mrs. Cheveley in the most lovely dress. Did you ask her? Mrs. Cheveley come to see me? It's impossible. But I assure you she's coming through the door as large as life and not nearly so natural. You need not wait, Mabel. Remember Lady Belgleton is expecting you. But I must shake hands with Lady Markby. She's delightful. Lady Markby, Mrs. Cheveley. Dear Gertrude. Lady Markby, how very nice of you to come to see me. Won't you sit down, Mrs. Cheveley? Thank you. Miss Chilton, I thought your gown so charming last night, so simple and suitable. Really? I must tell my dressmaker. She'll be so surprised. Goodbye, Lady Markby. You're remarkably modern, Mabel. A little too modern, perhaps. There's nothing so dangerous as being too modern. You'll have to grow old-fashioned quite suddenly. What a dreadful prospect. Oh, my dear, you needn't be nervous. You'll always be as pretty as possible. And that's the best fashion there is. And the only fashion England succeeds in setting. Thank you, Lady Markby, for England and myself. <laughs> Goodbye. Dear Gertrude, we just called to know if Mrs. Cheveley's diamond brooch had been found. Here? Yes, I missed it when I got back to Claridge's. I thought I might possibly have dropped it here. I've heard nothing about it, but I'll ring for Mason and find out. Oh, pray don't trouble. I dare say I lost it at the opera before we came on here. Oh, yes, of course it might have been at the opera. What sort of brooch was it? 
It was a diamond snake brooch with a ruby in it. A rather large ruby. Oh, Mason, has a ruby and diamond brooch been found here this morning? No, my lady. Oh, it's really of no consequence. I'm so sorry if I've put you to any inconvenience. It has been no inconvenience. That will do, Mason. You may bring tea. Well, I must say it's most annoying to lose anything. Will you have some tea, Mrs. Trevely? Oh, thank you. And you too, Lady Marcy? No, thank you, dear. The fact is, I promised to go around for ten minutes to see poor Lady Branches, who's in very great trouble. Her daughter, quite a well-brought-up girl, too, has actually become engaged to be married to a curate in Shropshire. Very sad, very sad indeed. And now, dear Gertrude, you will allow me. I shall leave Mrs. Trevely in your charge and call back for her in a quarter of an hour. I hope Mrs. Tilby will stay a little longer. I would like to have a few minutes' conversation with her. Oh, how very kind of you, Lady Tilton. Believe me, nothing would give me greater pleasure. Oh, no doubt you haven't any pleasant reminiscences of your school days to talk over together. Goodbye, dear Duchess. Goodbye, Lady Hopkins. Wonderful woman, Lady Marcy. Talks more and says less than anybody I know. She was made to be a public speaker. I think it is only right that I should tell you quite frankly, Mrs. Cheveley, that had I known who you really were, I would not have asked you to my house last night. I see that after all these years, you haven't changed a bit, Gertrude. I never change. Then life has taught you nothing. It has taught me that a person who has once been guilty of a dishonest action may be guilty of it a second time and should be shunned. Would you apply that rule to everyone? To everyone without exception? Then I'm sorry for you, Gertrude. I'm very sorry for you. I'm sure you will see that any further acquaintance between us during your stay in London is out of the question. Do you know, Gertrude, <laughs> I don't mind your talking morality a bit. Morality is simply the attitude we adopt towards people whom we personally dislike. You dislike me. I'm quite aware of that. And I've always detested you. And yet, I've come here to do you a service. Like the service you wished to render my husband last night, I suppose. Thank heaven I saved him from that. It was you who made him write that insolent letter to me. It was you who made him break his promise. Yes. Then you must make him keep it. I give you until tonight, no more. If by then your husband does not solemnly bind himself to help me in this great scheme in which I am interested. This fraudulent speculation. Call it what you choose. I hold your husband in the hollow of my hand, and if you're wise, you'll make him do what I tell him. You're impertinent. What has my husband to do with you with a woman like you? In this world, life meets with life. It is because your husband himself is fraudulent and dishonest that we pair so well together. Between you and him, there are chasms. He and I are closer than friends. We're enemies linked together. The same sin binds us. How... How dare you class my husband with yourself? How dare you threaten him and me? Leave my house, you are unfit to enter it. Your house? A house bought with a price of dishonor? A house, everything in which has been paid for by fraud. Ask him what the origin of his fortune is. Get him to tell you how he sold to a stockbroker a cabinet secret. Learn from him to what you owe your position. It is not true. Look at him. Can he deny it? Does he dare to? You've done your worst. Now go. Go at once. Oh, I've not yet finished with you. With either of you. I give you both until tonight. If by then you don't do as I bid you to do, the whole world shall know the origin of Robert Tilton. You sold a cabinet secret for money. You began your life with a fraud. You built up your career on dishonor. Tell me it is not true. Lie to me. What this woman says is quite true. But listen to me. Let me explain. Let me tell you the whole don't story. Don't near me. Don't touch me. What a mask you have worn all these years. You lied to the whole world, and yet you will not lie to me. Gertrude. Don't speak. Say nothing. Your voice picks terrible memories. Memories of things that made me love you. Words that made me love you. You were to me something apart from the common life. The world was a finer place because you were in it. I think that I made of a man like you my ideal. The ideal of my life. There was your mistake. Why can't you women love us, faults and all? 
When we men love women, we love them knowing their weaknesses, their follies, their imperfections. Love them all the more, maybe, for that very reason. It's not the perfect, but the imperfect who have need of love. Women think they're making ideals of men, what they're making of false idols. You made a false idol of me, and I hadn't the courage to tell you my weakness. I was afraid I might lose your love. But I have lost it now. There seems to be great interest in the canal schemes, Sir Robert. She has discovered everything. lady coming to see me this evening. When she arrives, show her straight into the drawing room. Yes, my lord. It's a matter of the greatest importance, Phipps. No one else is to be admitted under any circumstances. I understand, my lord. That probably is the lady. I'll see her myself. Very good, my lord. Well, sir, am I to wait attendance upon you? <laughs> Delighted to see you, father. Take my cloak off. Is it worthwhile, Father? Of course it's worthwhile. Which is the most comfortable chair? That one, Father. It's the chair I use myself when I have visitors. Thank you. No drafts in this room, I hope. No, Father. Glad to hear it. Can't stand drafts. <sighs> no drafts at home. But many breezes, Father. Huh? Huh? I don't understand what you mean. I want to have a serious conversation with you, sir. My dear father, at this hour? What's your objection to the hour? I think the hour's an admirable hour. Well, the fact is, father, this is not my day for talking seriously. I'm very sorry, but it's not my day. What do you mean, sir? During the season, father, I only talk seriously on the first Tuesday of every month from four to seven. Oh, makes Tuesday. Call it Tuesday. But it's after seven, father. And my doctor said I must have no serious conversation after seven. It makes me talk in my sleep. Talk in your sleep? What does that matter? You're not married? No, Father, I'm not married. <clears throat> That's what I've come to talk to you about. You've got to get married. And at once. Why, when I was your age, I'd been an inconsolable widower for three months and was already paying my addresses to your admirable mother. Damn me, sir, it's your duty to get married. You can't always be living for pleasure. Every man of position is married nowadays. Bachelors are no longer fashionable. Too much is known about them. They're a damaged lot. You've got to get a wife. Now, look where your friend Robert Chilton has got. By probity and hard work and a sensible marriage with a good woman. Why don't you imitate him, sir? Why don't you take him as your model? Yes, Father, I think I will. I hope you will, and I shall be happy. Doesn't I make your mother's life miserable on your account? You're heartless, sir, quite heartless. Oh, I hope not, Father. And it's high time you got married. You're 34 years. You're. Uh, 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 and there is a draft in this room which makes your conduct worse. Why did you tell me there was no draft? I feel a draft. I feel it distinctly. So do I, Father. It's a dreadful draft. I'll come and see you tomorrow and we'll discuss anything you like. Let me help you on your clothes. No, sir. Sure. I came here with a set purpose. And I mean to see it through at all cost to my health or yours. Well, let's go in the other room, Father. There's a wonderful fire in there. Your sneezes are quite heartrending, Father. Well, I suppose I can sneeze when I choose? Oh, quite so, Father. I was merely expressing sympathy. Oh, damn sympathy. There's a great deal too much of that sort of thing going on nowadays. I quite agree, Father. If there were less sympathy in the world, there'd be less trouble in the world. Yes. That's a paradox, sir, and I hate paradoxes. So do I, Father. Everybody one meets is a paradox nowadays. It's a great bore. It makes society so obvious. Do you really understand what you say? Uh, 
Yes, Father. If I listen attentively. Yes, I'm not attentively a conceited young puppy. His Lordship is engaged at present with Lord Caversham, madam. His Lordship told me to ask you to be good enough to wait in the drawing room for him. His Lordship will come to you there. Lord Goring expects me? Yes, madam. Are you quite sure? His Lordship told me that if a lady called, I was to ask her to wait in the drawing room. His Lordship's directions on the subject were very precise. How thoughtful of him. To expect the unexpected shows a thoroughly modern intellect. Oh, not that lamp. It's far too glaring. Light some candles. Certainly, madam. I hope the candles have very becoming shades. We have had no complaints about them, madam, as yet. I wonder what woman is waiting for tonight. It will be delightful to catch him. Men always look so silly when they're caught. And they're always being caught. Wonder what his correspondence is like. Cards, bills. Death, dowages. What an uninteresting correspondence. Who on earth writes to him on pink paper? So silly to write on pink paper. It looks like the beginning of a middle-class romance. Romance should never begin with sentiment. It should begin with science and end with a settlement. I know that handwriting. It's Gertrude Chilton. Oh, I remember it perfectly. The Ten Commandments in every stroke of the pen, and the moral law all over the page. What on earth could she be writing to him about? Something horrid about me, I suppose. How I detest that woman. I trust you. I want you. I'm coming to you. I trust you. I want you. I'm coming to you, Dick. The candles in the drawing room are lit, madam, as you directed. Thank you. I trust the shades will be to your liking. They are the most becoming that we have. They are the same as his lordship uses himself when he is dressing for dinner. Then I'm sure they'll be perfectly right. Thank you, madam. My dear father, surely if I'm to be married, you'll allow me to choose the time, the place, and the person. Particularly the person. It is I who should be consulted, sir, not you. There's property at stake. It's not a matter for affection. Affection comes later on in married life. Yes, in married life, affection comes when people thoroughly dislike each other, father, doesn't it? Certainly, sir. I mean, certainly not, sir. You're talking very foolishly tonight. What I say is, marriage is a matter for common sense. But women who have common sense are so curiously plain, Father, aren't they? Of course, I only speak from hearsay. No woman, plain or pretty, has any common sense at all. Common sense is the privilege of our sex. Quite so, Father. We men are so self-sacrificing, we never use it, do we? I use it. I use nothing else. So Mother tells me. It's the secret of your mother's happiness. You're very heartless, son. Very heartless. Oh, I hope not, Father. You ought to be in bed. Yes, Father. You keep too late hours. Yes, Father. Good night, Father. Mason, I've changed my mind. I shall not be going out. You may send the carriage away. Very well, milady. Piece of good luck finding you on the doorstep. <laughs> yes.
The fact is, Robert, I'm horribly busy tonight. I gave orders I'd not to be at home to anybody. Even my father got a comparatively cold reception. He complained of a draft the whole time. Oh, but you must be at home to me, Arthur. Perhaps by tomorrow you'll be the only friend I've got. My wife has discovered everything. I guessed as much. How? Oh, merely by something in the expression of your face. Who told her? Mrs. Cheveley herself. Now she knows that I began my career with an act of dishonesty. You've heard nothing from Vienna yet? Nothing is known against her. I don't know what to do, Arthur. I can trust you absolutely, can't I? Yes, of course. Oh, Phipps. Yes, my lord. Uh, excuse me, Robertson. Phipps, when that lady calls, tell her I'm not expected home this evening. Tell her I've been suddenly called out of town, you understand? The lady is in that room, my lord. You told me to show her into that room, my lord. You're perfectly right. Tell me what I should do, Arthur. My whole life seems to have crumbled about me since she found me out. Has she never in her life done some folly, some indiscretion she shouldn't forgive you? She doesn't know what weakness and temptation are. But I love her more than anything in the world. She will forgive you. Perhaps at this very moment she is forgiving you. She loves you, Robert. Shouldn't she forgive you? I hope so. I'm sorry, Robert. You don't mind my sending you away, do you? No, I must take five more minutes. There's something else I have to tell you. I've made up my mind. I've made up my mind what I'm going to say in the House of Commons tonight. The question on the Argentine Canal scheme will be asked about 11 o'clock. What was that? Nothing. I heard a chair fall in the other room. Someone's been listening. No, there's nobody there. There is someone there. Arthur, what does this mean? Robert, you're excited, unnerved. I tell you, there's no one in that room. Now sit down, Robert. You give me your word there's no one there? Yes. Your word of honor? Yes. Let me see for myself. This must stop. I have told you there is nobody in that room. That is enough. That is not enough. I insist on going in that room. You say there's no one there. What reason have you for refusing me? Oh, for God's sake, don't. There is someone in that room. Someone you mustn't see. I thought so. I forbid you to enter that room. What explanation have you to give me for her presence here? It was for your sake she came here. It was to try and save you she came here. She loves you and no one else. You're mad. What have I to do with her intrigues with you? You're well suited to each other. It is not true, Robert. In her presence and in yours, I'll explain everything. You've lied enough upon your word of honor. Good evening, Lord Goring. Great heavens, Mrs. Cheveley. May I ask what you're doing in my drawing room? Merely listening. I have a perfect passion for listening through keyholes. One always hears such wonderful things through them. Doesn't that sound rather like tempting Providence? Oh, surely Providence can resist temptation by this time. I'm glad you called. I'm going to give you some good advice. Pray don't. One should never give a woman anything she can't wear in the evening. You've come here to sell me Robert Chilton's letter, haven't you? To uh, offer it to you on condition. How did you get that? Because you haven't mentioned the subject. <laughs> Have you got it with you? <laughs> oh, no. A well-made dress has no pocket. What is your price for it? How absurdly English you are. The English think that a checkbook can solve every problem in life. Why, my dear Arthur, I have very much more money than you have, and quite as much as Robert Chilton's got hold of. Money is not what I want. What do you want, then, Mrs. Cheveley? Why don't you call me Laura? I don't like the name. You used to adore it. Yes, that's why. Arthur, you love me once. Yes. And you asked me to be your wife. That was the natural result of my loving you. And you threw me over because you saw, said you saw poor old Lord Mortlake trying to have a violent flirtation with me. I'm under the impression my lawyer settled that matter with you on certain terms. Dictated by yourself. At that time, I was poor. You were rich. Quite so. 
That is why you pretended to love me. Well, you were silly, Arthur. Lord Mortlake was never anything more to me than an amusement. One of those utterly tedious amusements one only finds at an English country house on an English country Sunday. I don't hold anyone at all morally responsible for what he or she does at an English country house. Yes, I know quite a lot of people think that. I loved you, Arthur. My dear Mrs. Cheesley, you've always been far too clever a woman to know anything about love. I did love you. And you loved me, you know you loved me. And love is a very wonderful thing. I suppose that when a man has once loved a woman, he will do anything for her except continue to love her. Yes, anything except that. I'm tired of living abroad. I want to live in London. I want to have a charming house here. I want to have a salon. <laughs> if one could only teach the English how to talk and the Irish how to listen, society here could be quite civilized. Besides, I've arrived at the romantic stage. Last night, when I saw you at the children's, I knew you were the only person I've ever really cared for, Arthur. If I've ever cared for anyone. And so, on the morning of the day you marry me, I will give you Robert Chilton's letter. That is my offer. I'll give it to you now if you promise to marry me. Now? Tomorrow. Are you quite serious? Yes, quite serious. I should make you a very bad husband. I don't mind bad husbands. I've had two. They amuse me immensely. You mean you amuse yourself immensely, don't you? What do you know about my married life? Nothing. But I can read it like a book. What book? The book of numbers. Do you think it's quite charming of you to be so rude to a woman in your own house? In the case of a very fascinating woman, sex is a challenge, not a defense. I suppose that is meant as a compliment. Now, my dear Arthur, women are never disarmed by compliments. Men always are. That's the difference between the two sexes. Women are never disarmed by anything, as far as I'm concerned. Then you're going to allow your friend Robert Chilton to be ruined. Rather than marry someone who really has considerable attractions left. I thought you would have risen to some great height of self-sacrifice, Arthur. I think you should. And the rest of your life, you could spend contemplating your own perfection. Oh, I do that in any case. Self-sacrifice is a thing that should be put down by law. It's so demoralizing to the people for whom one sacrifices oneself. As if anything could demoralize Robert Chilton. You seem to forget. I know his real character. What you know of Robert Chilton is not his real character. An act of folly done in his youth, not his true character. How you men stand up for each other. How you women war against each other. I only war against one woman, against Gertrude Chilton. I hate her. I hate her now more than ever. Because you brought real tragedy into her life? Oh, there's only one real tragedy in a woman's life. The fact that her past is always her lover, and her future invariably her husband. Lady Chilton knows nothing of the kind of life to which you allude. A woman who sighs and gloves is seven and three quarters, never knows very much about anything. Well, Arthur, I suppose this romantic interview may be regarded as at an end. You admit it was romantic, don't you? For the privilege of being your wife, I was ready to surrender a great prize, the climax of my diplomatic career. You decline? Very well. If Sir Robert doesn't uphold my Argentine scheme, I expose him, that's all. You mustn't do that. It'd be horrible. Oh, don't use big words. They mean so little. It's a commercial transaction, that's all. There's no good mixing up sentimentality in it. I offered to sell Robert Chilton a certain thing. If he won't pay me my price, he will have to pay the world a greater price. There's no more to be said. Well, I must be going. Goodbye. Won't you shake hands? You came here tonight to talk about love. You to whom the thing is a book closely sealed. You went this afternoon to the house of one of the most noble and gentle women in the world to degrade her husband in her eyes. That was horrible. That I cannot forgive you. But you're unjust to me, Arthur. Believe me, you're quite unjust to me. I didn't go to taunt Gertrude at all. I called with Lady Markby simply to ask whether a jewel that I'd lost somewhere last night had been found at the Chilton's. A diamond snake brooch with a ruby? Yes. How do you know? Because it is found. In point of fact, I found it myself. It's in this drawer. 
I foolishly forgot to tell the butler anything about it before I left. Is uh, this the ornament? Yes, I'm so glad to get it back. It was a present. Won't you wear it? Yes, if you pin it in. Why do you put it on as a bracelet? I never knew it could be worn as a bracelet. Really? No. But uh, it looks very well on me as a bracelet, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, much better than when I saw it last. When did you see it last? Oh, ten years ago, on Lady Berkshire. From whom you stole it. What do you mean? I mean you stole that ornament from my cousin Mary Berkshire, to whom I gave it as a wedding present. Suspicion fell on some wretched servant who was sent away in disgrace. I recognized it last night. I determined to say nothing about it until I'd found the thief. I have found her now. And I've heard her own confession. That is not true. Oh, you know it's true. Why, a thief is written across your face this minute. I'll deny the whole affair from beginning to end. I'll say I never saw this wretched thing before, that it was never in my possession. The drawback of stealing a thing, Mrs. Cheeble, is one never knows how wonderful the thing one steals is. You can't get that braces off unless you know where the spring is. And I see you don't know where the spring is. It's rather difficult to find. You brute. You coward! Oh, don't use big words. They mean so little. What are you going to do? I am going to ring for my servant. He's an admirable servant. Always comes the minute one calls for him. When he comes, I'm going to tell him to fetch the police. The police? What for? One of the boxes will prosecute you. That is what the police are for. Don't do that. I'll do anything you want. Anything in the world you want. Give me Robert Chilton's letter. Stop. Stop. Give me time to think. Give me Robert Chilton's letter. I haven't got it with me. I'll give it to you tomorrow. You know you're lying. Give it me at once. So well dressed a woman, Mrs. Cheveley, you have moments of admirable common sense. I congratulate you. Please let me glass of water. Certainly. Help me on with my cloak. With pleasure. Mr. Watkin. I beg to ask the Chancellor of the Exchequer a question, a question of which I've given him private notice. Uh, can the right honourable gentleman see his way to some reduction of the uniform rate of income tax at eightpence in the pound in view of its crippling effect on industry? <laughs> in reply to the honourable member, I regret that I'm unable to anticipate my budget statement. Where's Sir Robert Munford? In the house, Lord Goring. I must see him for five seconds. It's a matter of vital importance. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid you'll have to wait till he's finished his speech. I wonder what he's going to say. 
Colonel Hartley. I beg to ask the Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, a question of which I have given him private notice. Can he now make a statement on the government's policy as to the Argentine Canal scheme? In replying to the honorable and gallant member, I have the following statement to make. I'm laying on the table of the House the report of the special commission sent out to inquire into the importance and the present state of the Argentine Canal scheme. Her Majesty's government are in entire agreement with the findings of the commission and have come to the conclusion that the Argentine Canal scheme can in no way be supported by Her Majesty's government. Yeah. Is the right honourable gentleman aware that this scheme has been received with considerable support in many quarters? And is it not a fact that the members of the Commission were unduly biased against it? No, sir. Her Majesty's government are in entire agreement with the findings of the Commission. Perhaps the House will expect me to say something about the principles involved, and then to enlarge upon the application of those principles to this special case. As to the principles, political finance is not necessarily wrong. The Suez Canal was a great and splendid undertaking. It gave us our direct route to India. It had imperial value. It was necessary that we should have control. This Argentine Canal scheme is nothing but a commonplace stock exchange swindle. To say that it was a mere stock exchange speculation would be to treat it with improper leniency. The promoters of the scheme have managed to mobilize considerable forces for its success. They have sought to influence public opinion. They have brought pressure to bear on all those who are responsible for public expenditure. They have thoroughly misunderstood the way of British public life. Now and in the future, the law of conduct of British public life will be, as the Prime Minister said when he was threatened with assassination, I shall make my will and I will do my duty. We have made our will and we shall do our duty. I'm never going to try to harm Robert Chilton again. Fortunately, you have not the chance, Mrs. Cheever. Well, even if I had the chance, I wouldn't. On the contrary, I'm going to render him a great service. I'm charmed to hear it. It's a, a reformation. Yes. I can't bear so upright a gentleman being so shamefully deceived. And so... Well? I find that somehow Gertrude's dying speech and confession has strayed into my pocket. Do you mean... I mean that I sent Robert Chilton the love letter his wife wrote to you tonight. Love letter? I trust you. I want you. I'm coming to you. Mabel Chilton. I'm of a very nervous disposition, Father, especially in the morning. Well, I don't suppose the business wall is chance of her accepting you. I don't know how the betting stands today. If she did, she'd be the prettiest little fool in England. That is just what I'd like to marry. A thoroughly sensible wife reduced me to a state of complete lunacy in less than six months. You don't deserve her, sir. Oh, my dear Father, if we men married the women we deserve, we'd have a very poor time of it. How do you do, Lord Caversham? Ah, good morning. I hope Lady Caversham is quite well. Lady Caversham is as usual. As usual. Good morning, Miss Mabel. And Lady Caversham's bonnet. Are they at all better? I regret to say my wife's bonnet has suffered a serious relapse. Good morning, Miss Mabel. I hope an operation won't be necessary. Good morning, Miss Mabel. Oh, are you here? Of course you understand that after breaking your appointment, I shall never speak to you again. Oh, please don't say that. You're the only woman in London I really like to have listened to. 
do think you could make your son behave a little better occasionally, just as a change. I regret to say I have no influence at all upon my son. If I had, I know what I'd make him do. I'm afraid he has one of those terribly weak natures that are not susceptible to influence. He's very heartless. Very heartless. It seems to me I'm a little in the way here. It is good for you to be in the way and to hear what people say of you behind your back. I don't at all like to know what people say about me behind my back. It makes me far too conceited. Oh, oh, after that, my dear, I must really bid you good morning. You're not going to leave me alone with Lord Gordon, especially at such an early hour of the day. I can't take him to Downing Street. It's not the Prime Minister's day for seeing the unemployed. I'm sorry, sir. This is a private letter. I opened it by mistake. letter of yours makes me feel that nothing the world may do can hurt me now. I don't care what disgrace is in store for me as long as you love me still. There is no disgrace in store for you. Mrs. Cheveley has handed back to Lord Goring the document that was in her possession. He brought it here this morning. thinking it might mean public disgrace. But it has not been so. Public honor has been the result. I think so. I fear so almost. Although I'm safe from detection, I suppose I should retire from public life. I suppose you should. It is your duty. There's much to surrender. There's much to gain. Can you be happy living with me alone, abroad, or in the country maybe? away from London, away from public life, and have no regrets? None. And your ambition for me? Oh, my ambition. I have none but that we may love each other. Let us not talk about ambition. Quite right. Quite right. Very good. Good. Now. Ah. Good morning, ladies and children. Good morning. Warmest congratulations, Robert, on your brilliant speech last night. I just left the Prime Minister. You ought to have the vacant seat in the Cabinet. A seat in the Cabinet? Certainly, and you will deserve it. You've got what we need so much nowadays in political life. High character, high moral tone, high principles. Those are the very words in the Times leader this morning. I cannot accept this offer, Lord Caversham. I have to decline it. You de decline it? It's my intention to retire at once from public life. Decline a seat in the cabinet and retire from public life? I never heard such damn nonsense in the whole course of my existence. I, I beg your pardon, Lady Children. I, I beg your pardon, Robert. I, I, Lady Children, you're a sensible woman. You're the most sensible woman I know. Will you kindly prevent your husband from making such a... such a... Um, um, from, from talking such uh, Will you kindly do that, Lady Children? But I think he's right in his determination. I approve of it. You approve of it? Good heavens. Well, seems to be nothing I can do except go back and tell the Prime Minister. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Good day, Robert. On my soul. On my soul. What's the matter with this family? Idiocy. Hereditary, I suppose. Both of them, too. Wife as well as husband. They're not an old family. Can't understand it. Miss Mabel, I have something very particular to say to you. 
Is it a proposal? Well, yes, it is. Yes, I'm bound to say it is. I'm so glad it's the second today. The second today? What conceited ass has been impertinent enough to dare to propose to you before I'd proposed to you? Tommy Trafford, of course. It is one of Tommy's days for proposing. Oh, bother Tommy Trafford. Tommy's a silly little ass. And I love you. I know. And I think you might have mentioned it before. Mabel, do be serious. Please be serious. That's the sort of thing that a man says to a girl before he has been married to her. He never says it afterwards. Mabel, I've told you that I loved you. Can't you love me a little in return? If you knew anything about anything which you don't, you'd know that I adore you. The whole of London knows it except you. I've been going around for six months telling the whole of society that I adore you. It's a wonder you consent to speak to me. I have no character left at all. At least I, I feel so happy that I'm sure I have no character left at all. Darling, do you know I was awfully afraid of being refused? I'm not nearly good enough for you. Oh, I'm so glad. I was afraid you were. <laughs> That admirable father of mine really makes a habit of turning up at the wrong moment. Very heartless, Arthur. Very heartless indeed. I shall be back home in 15 minutes. Don't get into any temptations while I'm away. When you're away, there are none. It makes me horribly dependent on you. Arthur, Chilton wants to retire from public life. And his wife agrees with him. What's the matter with that family? Something wrong there, eh? <laughs> idiocy, I say. No, Father, it's not idiocy, I assure you. It's what's called nowadays a high moral tone. Ah, oh, take these newfangled names. It's what we used to call idiocy 50 years ago. Well, I've got to go and tell the Prime Minister. Oh, wait a minute, Father. You have to come to the Chilton's with me. What for? Uh, there's someone there I'd like you to talk to. What about? Uh, about me, Father. Yes. Not a subject about which much eloquence is possible. No, Father, the lady is like me. She doesn't care much for eloquence in others. No. She finds it a little loud. When you told me this morning that Mrs. Cheveley had stolen the letter that I wrote you and sent it to my husband, I tried to intercept it, but it was too late. Fortunately, the brilliant Mrs. Cheveley does not seem to have noticed that there was no name at the beginning of it. So that Robert thought that I had written it to him. I hadn't the courage to tell him the truth. Sometimes it takes more courage not to tell the truth. I have never lied to him before. I'm beginning to understand many things. Why are you playing Mrs. Cheveley's cards? I don't understand you. Mrs. Cheveley made an attempt to ruin your husband. Why should you do him the wrong that she tried to do and failed? What sort of an existence will he have if you close the doors of public life against him? He who was made for success. But it is my husband himself who wishes to retire from public life. He said so first. But rather than lose your love, Robert will do anything. Take my advice, Lady Chilton, and do not accept a sacrifice so great. If you do, you'll live to regret it bitterly. You're right. I am delighted you've changed your mind, Robert. Delighted. And if the country doesn't go to the dogs or the radicals, we'll have your prime minister someday. Got a great future before you. Wish I could say the same thing about you, sir. But your future will have to be entirely domestic. Yes, Father, I prefer it domestic. Hmm? And if you don't make this young lady an ideal husband, I'll cut you off with a shilling. An ideal husband? I don't think I should like that. It sounds like something in the next world. Well, what do you want him to be, my dear? But he can be what he chooses. All I want is to be a real wife to him. There's a good deal of common sense about that. Stop. My dear Duke. Ah, oh, dear Mrs. Chief. What a surprise. I've not seen you since Vienna. Not since Vienna. And you were younger and more beautiful than ever. How do you manage it? By making it a rule only to talk to perfectly charming people like yourself. Oh, everybody knows how brilliant you are, Mrs. Chief. Thank you, Duke. A meeting that begins with a compliment is sure to develop into a real friendship. It starts in the right manner. Won't you accompany me? Very glad indeed, Mrs. Cheech. 